It was Sunday morning, June 11th, 2017, that we started our study in the book of Genesis that we call the Summer Spiritual Heritage Series. And throughout the course of this study, of course, we just did it throughout the summer times. The reason that we did this study was manyfold. Uh, first of all, so that we would understand that this is our own spiritual heritage. This is your story. This is our story as believers uh, in the Lord, the living God. And second of all, because it reminds us of the sweeping drama of redemptive history, seeing how God has enabled and caused this unfolding story to uh, become reality. And it reminds us as well that the Scriptures are all fulfilled in Jesus Christ. And we've seen this in this book as well, that He is the promised seed of the woman who would crush the head of the serpent. He is the one through whom all the families of the earth will be blessed one day. And we also saw in our study that the Scriptures are relevant. All the Scriptures are relevant to our daily lives. So I hope you've seen some very practical applications, and I hope you'll see some today as well. But you noticed also that in speaking of the Scriptures being fulfilled in Christ, we've seen that Joseph is a type of Christ. Joseph is a picture of what Christ would be like, and we're going to be discovering a little bit more about that today too. But this book of Genesis, how foundational it truly is. What are the things that we've learned that pave the way for the rest of our understanding of theology and Scripture? Well, we've learned that the universe in which we live was created by God Almighty, by His Word. We also learned that humans are not chunks of randomly evolved matter, but specially created in God's image to love and serve Him. We also learned about marriage, that marriage isn't just some social contract, but it's designed by God to be monogamous, one man and one woman, and it's designed to be heterosexual, one man and one woman, and it's designed to be a blessing to society as long as the world exists. And we've learned another very important principle. We've learned how the world got to be in the mess that it's in. We learned that the first couple sinned, and we have been their offspring ever since through original sin. But we've also learned that our gracious God promised a Savior who would address that problem, that He's going to redeem a people for Himself, and that He's not going to be standing by, wringing His hands, wondering how it's going to work out, but He is directing the very course of history to make sure that this redemptive purpose is fulfilled in the promised Messiah. And he places milestone promises in the form of covenants in the landscape of history to show that he intends to do so. And we also learned right away as we studied this book of Genesis, how is it that we are to approach God? How is it we can be right with God? Well, it's not by our good works. No, it's by faith alone. Justification by faith. The seeds of that are clear. And so, as we lay this foundation, as we finish this foundational book, we're coming to the end of uh, the story of Joseph also. And uh, we're going to be finishing chapter 49 and then wrapping up chapter 50, but let's pray together. Father in heaven, we thank you so much for this foundation you have laid for us in your word. So much we have learned about, about ourselves, about our world, about our need. And please help us now to, to see uh, your glory again in fulfilling your purpose. In Jesus' name, amen. Remember we left off finishing verse 28. We were talking about the blessings that God uh, was, Jacob was beseeching God to pour down upon his sons and his grandsons. And now we come to Jacob's wishes concerning his death, verse 29 of chapter 49. Then he commanded them and said to them, I am to be gathered to my people. Bury me with my fathers in the cave that is in the field of Ephron the Hittite, in the cave that is in the field of Machpelah to the east of Mamre, in the land of Canaan, which Abraham bought with a field from Ephron the Hittite to possess as a burying place. There they buried Abraham and Sarah his wife. There they buried Isaac and Rebekah his wife. And there I buried Leah. 
The field and the cave that is in it were bought from the Hittites. When Jacob finished commanding his sons, he drew up his feet into the bed and breathed his last and was gathered to his people. We saw earlier in our study that the patriarchs were buried in this cave. Machpelah literally means double cave. And it's a sacred site to this day. And I'd encourage you, if you want to have an interesting study, Google Machpelah uh, and take a look at all the interesting uh, inter intricacies of that site, uh, how it was discovered, additional discoveries that were made, hidden caves uh, and catacombs where uh, it's likely that these, the bones of the patriarchs were found. And you notice that Jacob gives very specific instructions about this. And we'll see that those instructions are fulfilled. In chapter 50, we come to the death, the uh, consequences of the death of Jacob. Joseph fell on his father's face and wept over him and kissed him. And Joseph commanded his servants, the physicians, to embalm his father. So the physicians embalmed Israel. Forty days were required for it, for that is how many uh, are required for embalming. And the Egyptians wept for him seventy days. Yes, Jacob was embalmed by the Egyptian custom, and what was the Egyptian custom? We know that mummification is the Egyptian custom, and if you look that up, you'll discover that it was a process, uh, the basic foundation of which took 40 days. This is a summary in Scientific American. The body was thoroughly dried out to remove all the moisture. The embalmers used a chemical called natron, which is a naturally derived salt with excellent drying properties. And then they performed some other functions until they finally wrapped the body in 100 yards of linen, uh, many layers. Yes, that's mummification. We're told that they mourned for 70 days, 40 days it would have taken for that uh, initial process, and the usual time for mourning was 30 days. So that's how we get the, the 70 days. But this wasn't going to be the end of it by any means. Jacob was not to remain in Egypt. So Joseph had to get permission from Pharaoh to go. Verse 4, when the days of weeping for him were past, Joseph spoke to the household of Pharaoh, saying, If now I have found favor in your eyes, please speak in the ears of Pharaoh, saying, My father made me swear, saying, I am about to die. In my tomb that I hewed out for myself in the land of Canaan, there you shall bury me. Now, therefore, let me please go up and bury my father. Then I will return. And Pharaoh answered, Go up and bury your father as he made you swear. Now, Joseph was a very important person in Egypt. And so it wasn't a good thing for him just to up and go away for a long time. This journey was 600 miles. And it could have been uh, read as a seditious action. But Joseph made it clear what his intentions were. And he emphasized the importance by reminding, Joseph, by reminding Pharaoh that his father made him swear that he would return the bones of Jacob back to the promised land. And you'll notice that Pharaoh takes that. He says, well, you know, bury your father as he made you swear. Pharaoh also knew what kind of a man that Joseph was. He knew he was a man of honesty and integrity. He knew he was a man who was going to come back and fulfill his responsibilities. So in verse 7, we see them going up. Joseph went up to bury his father. With him went all the servants of Pharaoh, the elders of his household, and all the elders of the land of Egypt, as well as all the household of Joseph, his brothers, and his father's household. Only their children, their flocks, their herds were left in the land of Goshen. And there went up with him both chariots and horsemen. It was a very great company. And when they came to the threshold, threshing floor of Atad, which is beyond the Jordan, they lamented there with a great and grievous lamentation. And he made a mourning for his father seven days. What a sight this must have been. Do you see everybody who went along? It's not just Joseph's family, but it's a large part of Pharaoh's household, Pharaoh's officials, Pharaoh's governors. Now imagine this train going through the desert with these highly embellished Egyptian wagons and uh, in their outfits, and there's Jacob's coffin. It must have been quite a sight to behold. And as I mentioned earlier, this was not a short journey. This was 600 miles from 
Goshen to the promised land. But it's also likely that they took the long way around. You'll notice it says that they came to the threshing floor of Atad, which is beyond the Jordan, which means it's on the eastern side of the Jordan. They didn't come up through the southern route, but they went around the Dead Sea, probably because they wanted to avoid the Philistines, whom they knew would give them some trouble. And so they were across the river, across the Jordan River, and Joseph decided to pause and weep, have a time, another time of mourning, another seven days of mourning. And look how this time is described. It says it's in verse uh, 10, a very great and grievous lamentation. He made a mourning for his father seven days. And in verse 11, when the inhabitants of the land, the Canaanites, saw the mourning on the threshing floor of Atad, they said, this is a grievous mourning by the Egyptians. Therefore, the place was named Abel Mitzrayim. It's beyond the Jordan. You know there had to be a lot of Egyptians along because when those around saw it, they thought they were Egyptians and only Egyptians. And so they named the place Abel Mitzrayim, which means meadow of Egypt. But the Hebrew word for meadow is very close to the word for mourning and grieving. And so there's a, a play on words there, but this place was renamed for that purpose. And you see all this grieving and you see all this mourning. Mourning is appropriate for those whom we've lost. But in the Lord, we do not grieve as those who have no hope, do we? In two weeks, we're going to be starting a series uh, on the Beatitudes, that wonderful opening part of the Sermon on the Mount. And you remember the second Beatitude, blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. So in Christ, we grieve but it's not a despairing grief because we have hope and the assurance of the resurrection, the great victorious resurrection of our Savior for those who trust in Him. And so you see, they went, just as was promised, they buried Him, verse 12, thus His sons did for Him as He had commanded them, for His sons carried Him to the land of Canaan and buried Him in the cave of the field at Machpelah to the east of Mamre, which Abraham bought with a field from Ephron the Hittite, to possess as a burying place. After he had buried his father, Joseph returned to Egypt with his brothers and all who had gone up with him to bury his father. Now, my friends, it gets quite interesting because we're learning here what concerned Joseph's brothers all this time. What were they concerned about? They are concerned that Joseph is just waiting to get them. Look at verse 15. When Joseph's brothers saw their father was dead, they said, it may be that Joseph will hate us and pay us back for all the evil that we did to him. They're just thinking about this, and now the tide has turned. They're coming back to Egypt, this long journey. You can imagine the conversation. What are we going to do now? Do you think, is he going to get us? Is he finally going to get us? And then they hatch their plot. What should we do? So they sent a messenger. They sent a messenger, to, a message to Joseph saying, your father gave this command before he died. Say to Joseph, please forgive the transgression of your brothers and their sin, because they did evil to you. And now please forgive the transgression of the servants of the God of your father. So some anonymous messenger was sent to tell Joseph that his father told this anonymous messenger that, they're not, that he's not supposed to take vengeance on his brothers. Isn't that amazing? All this time. I mean, you remember back in chapter 45 when Joseph revealed himself? And right away he said to his, to his brothers, he said, don't be angry with yourselves. He says, God meant this for good. You meant it for evil. God meant it for good to save a multitude. So he told them that years before, but somehow they believed that all this goodness, all this kindness that, that he had given to them was just a ruse, was just a deception, so that when Jacob was finally gone, he would get him. That was not Joseph at all, was it? No, and look, 
In verse 18, his brothers did follow close behind to see what his response would be. Joseph said, uh, excuse me, verse 18, his brothers also came and fell down before him and said, behold, we are your servants. So here we have that picture one more time, the fulfillment of that dream. Remember when the brothers would bow down? Well, here they are again bowing down. But we've already seen Joseph's heart, haven't we? What's his response? Did he say, yeah, now that dad's gone, I'm going to get you. Now he was weeping. He was weeping. How could you po- He's thinking, how could you possibly think that I would do this, that I would have this attitude? Look what Joseph says. Verse 19, Joseph said to them, do not fear. Don't be afraid. Those are words we like to hear when we think we're in trouble. We've got nothing to worry about. Do not fear. And then he says, am I in the place of God? You know, I have forgiven you. I am not your ultimate judge. If there is anything more, God will deal with that. But then he doesn't downplay their sin either, does he? He says, you meant evil against me. Here it is again. You meant evil against me. But God meant it for good. Joseph was a sovereigntist. He could see, he could see the big picture. Now, granted, you know, hindsight is 2020. He was in a place where he could now see where all of this was, what it was building to. But you need to remember that Joseph was faithful in the middle of the hardship, wasn't he? Even when he couldn't see how it was going to work out, he was, he was still trusting God. If there's ever a practical picture of Romans 8.28, here it is. We know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love Him, to those who are called according to His purpose. Here it is. George Lawson wrote, When you meet with injuries, consider what may be the intention of God's providence in the sufferings you are called to endure. Your enemies intend to harm you, but God surely intends no harm to those who trust in Him. In everything that He permits to be done, however bad, He must intend good to them that love Him. And notice that Joseph says one more time, he says, verse 21, do not be afraid. He starts with bookends, do not be afraid, do not be afraid. And he says, not only am I not going to take vengeance on you, look, he says, I'm going to take care of you. I'm going to continue taking care of you. This is the grace of God through Joseph. And you think about applications up to this point, I think we see in Joseph, don't we, a picture of the forgiveness of God. Sometimes you might think that the forgiveness of God is too good to be true. Are you really forgiven? Jerry Bridges wrote, we tend to drag up our old sins, that we tend to live under a vague sense of guilt. We're not nearly as vigorous in appropriating God's forgiveness as He is in extending it. Consequently, instead of living in the sunshine of God's forgiveness through Christ, we tend to live under an overcast sky of guilt most of the time. Is that true of you? Have you received the fullness, the assurance of forgiveness? When we come to the Lord in sorrow and repentance, He says, do not be afraid. Do not be afraid. Yes, He is in the place of God because He is God. And yes, we confess our sins, we come to Him, we agree with Him. Remember, it means to agree with God, and God knows our sins better than we do. He knows the implications of our sins and the consequences of our sins for ourselves and other people better than we do, and yet He forgives us. And what we've seen in this book of Genesis is how the extent to which He goes so that we might be forgiven, laying this foundation in these promises that are finally fulfilled in the coming of His Son, our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. A costly gift from God the Father. I wonder if if we can ever imagine the sadness that comes to the heart of God when we doubt that we're really forgiven. He says, look at the cross. Look at the cross. R.C. Sproul wrote, what do you do with a person who says, I've asked God to forgive me about this, but I still feel guilty. I hear that, R.C. writes, over and over again. I usually say to these people, if you still feel guilty, then pray to God again. 
But this time, don't ask Him to forgive you for the sin that is haunting you. Rather, ask Him to forgive you for insulting His integrity by refusing to accept His forgiveness. Who are you to refuse to forgive yourself when God has forgiven you? When God promises to forgive His people when they repent, He is not playing games. If He says He will forgive you, then He will forgive you. And if He forgives you, you are forgiven. If He forgives you, you are forgiven. Thank you. Thank you. My dear friends Jim and Beverly Nirmala are here from Crossroads in Upper Darby, and uh, they know from our church down there that uh, I don't have to ask for an amen. <laughs> but not only do we see a, a picture of the forgiveness of God here, but we also see a picture of how we should forgive one another. We have learned in the book of Genesis that thanks to the first couple, we sin. We have a sin nature, uh, and we also know that though we are forgiven, we are not perfect. As the Apostle John wrote, if we say we do not have sin, we are liars and the truth of God is not in us. You know what that means? That means you're a sinner. That means I am a sinner. We're all sinners. And therefore, confession and forgiveness needs to be a regular part of our community, in our families, in our church, in our relationships. Martin Luther wrote, May a merciful God preserve me from a Christian church in which everyone is a saint. Now, it doesn't mean in the theological sense that we are all saints, but he means in the, the perfection kind of saint. I want to be and remain in the church and little flock of the faint-hearted, the feeble, the ailing, who feel and recognize the wretchedness of their sins, who sigh and cry to God incessantly for comfort and help, who believe in the forgiveness of sins. Isn't it interesting that we believe in the doctrine of human depravity and then we're surprised when people sin? And we pretend that we don't sin? It makes no sense. And if there was ever a person who was justified in bearing a grudge, it was Joseph. If there's, oh, no. If there's ever a person who was justified in bearing a grudge, it was Jesus Christ, our Lord. And yet He extends to us forgiveness at the cost of His own life. And now we are able to exercise one of the remarkable prerogatives, privileges that is godlike, and that is to forgive another person. Isn't that what Paul wrote to the Ephesians? Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, as God in Christ forgave you. There's the model. And that's the reason there's no place for grudge bearing, or as Paul calls it, a root of bitterness among the people of God. Because when we, do our, when we do that, we're placing ourselves in the place of God, giving ourselves a prerogative not to forgive when He's already forgiven. Martin Lloyd-Jones wrote, whenever I see myself before God and realize something of what my blessed Lord has done for me at Calvary, I'm ready to forgive anybody anything. <laughs> I cannot withhold it. I don't want to withhold it. So when someone asks you forgiveness, you say, oh, this is an opportunity for me to extend the grace that I've received in Christ. I forgive you. Or the courage to ask for forgiveness. These are words that should be commonplace among the people of God. One writer said, every man should keep a fair-sized cemetery in which to bury the faults of his friends. And at the end of the chapter, we see, we see the death of Joseph. Joseph remained in Egypt, he and his father's house. Joseph lived 110 years, and Joseph saw Ephraim's children of the third generation. The children also of Machir, the son of Manasseh, were counted as Joseph's own. And Joseph said to his brothers, I'm about to die, but God will visit you and bring you up out of this land to the land that he swore to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. Then Joseph made the sons of Israel swear, saying, God will surely visit you and you shall carry up my bones from here. So Joseph died, being 110 years old. They embalmed him, and he was put in a coffin in Egypt. Joseph is truly one of the most remarkable men in the whole Bible. He was a man of the highest integrity. Nothing negative is attributed to him. When he was tested, he endured with faith. When those acted against him, 
unjustly. He did not respond with bitterness, but forgiveness. When he was tempted by Potiphar's wife, he did not give in, but rather took a stand for his God. He was a man of many gifts and talents whom God used to deliver not only his own people, but the people of the time, the Egyptians and other surrounding peoples from starvation, from the famine. And he recognized, he recognized that God was at work to accomplish his purposes through all of this. But I find it interesting that, you know that Hebrews 11 hall of faith, the hall of fame of the people of faith, do you know what Joseph is recognized for? Hebrews 11:22. By faith, Joseph, at the end of his life, made mention of the exodus of the Israelites and gave directions concerning his bones. That is how Joseph's faith is remembered. And what was the faith that he had? He said he knew that the people of God would be in Egypt for hundreds of years, but he also knew that God would keep his promise to return the people to that promised land from whence would be born that Redeemer. And yes, Joseph was a man of great integrity, but there was only one who perfectly kept the law, Jesus Christ. Joseph was sold by his brothers, but Jesus was abandoned by his own disciples. Yes, Joseph was tempted by Potiphar, but Jesus was tempted by Satan himself, and he overcame, and he was victorious. And Jesus Christ walked through the greatest injustices of all. Why? So we could accomplish redemption, salvation, forgiveness for you and for me. And though a righteous man, yes, imagine this, they kept, they kept Joseph's bones all those years. They were in Egypt for another 400 years, but they knew where Joseph's bones were. And when it came time to pack up on that hurried departure from Egypt, somebody had to say, don't forget Joseph's bones. So they loaded up Joseph's bones, and they carried those bones through the parting of the Red Sea. They carried those bones through the desert, across the River Jordan. And the end of Joshua, the book of Joshua, you can read that the bones of Joseph were interred in the Promised Land. In that place, in the expectation that one day the Redeemer would come. Yep, Joseph's bones are still there, somewhere. You know what? You cannot find the bones of Jesus Christ. Jesus was buried. You know, if they found the bones of Jesus Christ, Christianity would be done for because he'd be just like anybody else, but he's not just like anybody else because he rose from the dead as the seal of the promises of God, as the guarantee that anyone who believes in him will not perish but will have everlasting life. This is the faithfulness of God and the assurance that we have in His great promises. Let's pray. Father, we thank You. Thank You so much for the opportunity to, to study Your remarkable Word and how much we've learned about ourselves and how much we've learned about our world. And Lord, we pray that You would help us to take to heart, first of all, the reality of our own depravity how desperately we need uh, our Savior, Jesus Christ. And I ask if there is anyone here or anyone who is, who is viewing this who has not yet trusted in Jesus Christ, who is alive, that they would do so and receive the promises that were fulfilled in His coming. We also ask, O oh Lord, for the faith for each one of us to, to endure hard times, to, to see that uh, You truly are working all things for good. Uh, according to your purposes, and may we all uh, look to you constantly, thanking you for your faithfulness, for we ask it in Jesus' name, amen.